just before I start, um, I find it a bit amusing to be, in the, uh, be up here talking today, actually, because I'm here talking to some ex-colleagues of mine that I used to work with at Geosoft in my Anglo-American days. Uh, so with Tim and Darren in, in the audience there, I think it was perhaps 20 years ago that we were working on geochemistry software together. And honestly, I just think it's the best thing that you're all together now, because I think that uh, partnership, partnership between Geosoft and Sequent going forward makes a hell of a lot of sense. And I think there's an ex excellent uh, cultural fit between the two companies as well. Uh, and I think uh, truly, ironically, Tim, by the end of this talk, I'll be talking about geophysics. So uh, never say never uh, in the world as we go on. Um, now, this talk, so um, I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, about the past, uh, what we're doing now, what's on the immediate time horizon, and then something uh, really talking two or three years out. And I think uh, the latter part of the talk segues into some things that Mike Stewart was talking about. Um, but before that, I actually had a look back at the talk I gave at the first Lyceum uh, here in early 2016, about a bit over two and a half years ago now. And I just picked two slides out, and one of them was an example of innovation at the time, which was our gas link link between our IOGAS desktop software and the LeapFrog Geo desktop software, that live link. Um, that is still going strong, people still love it, uh, and indeed still when people see it, they still think it's black magic when you change something in one piece of software and it updates automatically in the other piece of software. Um, I can't tell you how simple that was for us to do because that's a secret. Uh, but nevertheless, it still has a good reception in the market. Um, one of the last slides in that presentation back from them was a statement about where we were trying to go in the future as Index, or the part of the company called Reflex at the time. And, and it was depicted as a simple slide. So there we've got two scenarios, two drilling scenarios, an exploration scenario and a production drilling scenario. And the simple concept was that as the data was being generated at the rig, in either an exploration context or a production context. That data was flowing up into an Internet of Things type system and then flowing back into LeapFrog Geo at the time and the implicit model was being built as the data was being generated. So that was the idea back then and in fact that slide's a couple of years older than that. So this concept has been floating around for about five years or so. Uh, but here really today what I'm here to show you is we've done it we're at the start of the start. We've actually made this possible, uh, and this is the starting point of it, and I'll explain to you how it works. And then also other data types we're looking at bringing into this same system uh, systematically over the next couple of years. Um, I'll just skip over that one and go to here. The other thing about this is because of the, I suppose the alignment in the way the two companies think and wanting to be innovative and do things slightly differently, um, when I sat down to have coffee with Sean in Christchurch just a bit over 12 months ago now, and we are looking at the gas link and said, well, what should we do next? And over the years, we've found that both companies have actually been on quite a parallel development path. Um, and at the time, we were nearing the end of a journey of trying to connect all of our infield instrumentation into our cloud-based environment, Internet of Things type environment, what we call Index Hub IQ. Uh, and then Arantz, or Sequent at the time, was also then building out their LeapFrog Central platform, another cloud-based platform which would give people uh, access to that platform no matter they were in a simple browser-based environment. So the very simple coffee conversation was, let's connect our clouds together, and that's where it started. And in fact, that's what we've done. Um, we have to start somewhere, and that slide there, a couple of the in-field tools we have there, surveys and structural, uh, structural measurement device called the um, Index Hub, sorry, called the IQ Logger, uh, they're the two that we've started with first to take through uh, into our cloud environment and connect it straight across uh, into, into Central. Now, a little bit about the surveying tools. Um, we've spoken a little bit about drilling here today, and if I just come back to that, um, being on the other side of the fence now, working in a company that supplies technology to drill rigs all around the world, uh, we are exposed on a daily basis to drill programs that have gone horribly wrong. Um, or are conducted horribly inefficiently. Um, but the fact is that in this day and age, and especially once I show you this connected through to Central, there is not one reason where you shouldn't know where the drill bit is, plus or minus the length of the core barrel, at any point in time, okay? There is just no more, there are no more excuses for not knowing that anymore. Um, now, the surveying technology is well known. MAG survey tools, gyro tools, 
uh, other tools now which are able to be deployed by the driller, which can be run in and out of a drill hole extremely rapidly. That's uh, the Sprint IQ there. It's another North Seeking gyro. Uh, rather than giving you dot-based surveys uh, down the hole that you need to interpolate along, this will just give you a continuous survey down the hole and you can get it in and out of the hole at up to 200 metres uh, per minute uh, if you're game enough and the drillers can run it for you. The simple use case here is that as soon as that tool comes out of the hole, it will connect up to Index Hub IQ. That data will then flow through into Central and you'll be able to look at it immediately in your Central browser in relation to all of your other three-dimensional geological context. Now, that's really fast to say, but I can tell you that if you sit someone down in front of a computer and they have Central open and they're looking at a visualisation of their drill program, and they have the live drill connection open, which is that dialog box you can see there um, on your left. Um, you see there that plan drill holes, drill hole survey, and structural data are all coming live out of the Index Hub IQ across into Central automatically. Once you set up the connection, there is no human interaction necessary after that point. If a, someone runs a survey anywhere on the planet, the drill hole on your screen will advance as soon as that data is synced and the tool comes out of the, when it comes out of the drill hole. So like I said, it's a really, really simple proposition, one I find compelling and one I frankly find troubling when I explain to people what it does and they don't quite get why it would be useful. Right? Um, that's how compelling I think it is. So that's in real time, knowing exactly what's going on in your drill program in relation to all of the other three-dimensional information you already have your hands on. The other element of real-timeness is with structural logging. So if you're, if you're actually logging your diamond drill core these days, uh, and there's the boys over in Christchurch there seeing, doing some development work. Uh, so what's the, what's the value proposition here? So we have a tool called the IQ Logger, um, Anglo-American's chief uh, technical lead of structural geology, uh, actually calls it a laser protractor, which I think is a far more sexy name than the IQ logger. Uh, but the premise is that once you have your orientation mark on the core, uh, the IQ logger itself has gyros or inertial measuring units in it. You reference it back to the core, you lift it up, you line up the laser on the structure, press a button, and you've measured the orientation of that structure. Now the trick is, if you've surveyed the hole and you go into the hub, you can pick the hole path that you want. So you can either calculate the dip and dip direction, not the alpha and beta, and plot that directly against your plant hole, uh, or you can select the orientation method that you actually used on the hole, and it will resolve all of that out for you automatically. No more alphas and betas, no more stupid spreadsheets that you don't know where you got them from in the first place, and doing all of these ridiculous calculations. Um, the next step in this connection is that as you take that structural measurement, it flows up into the hub it takes the actual surveyed path of the hole into account, calculates the dip and dip direction, sends it straight through into central, and you see the structure that you just logged on that drill core in relation to the structural model. Right? So no more collecting structural data over a few months coming back and seeing that it wasn't oriented correctly, half the drill core was spun, uh, most of it's just rubbish anyway, we need to start again. In fact, why do we even bother doing this sort of log logging of drill core? Um, you know, the fact that you can use that data immediately, see it immediately, means that most of the QAQC issues are solved in that five seconds after you took the reading, right? So it's all fixed up front. Um, and that, that is, um, obviously, that's a big theme and a big rationale behind making all of this data live and putting it in people's faces as it's happening. Um, so they're the first two. So those two data types are now available live in this plumbing uh, coming through from the index tool set into central. Um, next caps off the rank. So that's the that's the that's now. In the very near future, we're going to start transmitting gamma logging data and XRF, uh, so chemical data as well. Um, so just an example here of what gamma logging may look like or will look like in six months' time. Uh, same thing. So we can have drillers getting you gamma logs. What does that mean? So this is an example of some air core holes into some uncons unconsolidated ground. Um, we can determine the deviation of those holes, even air core holes deviate over 100, 150 metres. At the same time, we can collect the gamma signal in rods, so you don't need to pull the rods out, have the hole collapse, not be able to get, mount it, uh, get back down the hole to get the logging done. Um, in this future state, which is only six months away, 
you will see those holes appearing uh, in central and you'll see the gamma data appear as the gamma data is being generated in central, hole to hole to hole. If we push that concept just a little bit further, then we, can, we are currently working on a system, sorry, just go ahead a bit, um, a system here looking at wavelet tessellation. This is a bit of IP that June Hill at the CSIRO developed. Um, we are looking at building this into the hub as well, so it will take something like a continuous trace of data like gamma, and it will do the hole picking for you. Sorry, it will do the boundary picking for you. So again, you don't need to uh, extrapolate your mind too far in advance to see that we will drill the hole, tell you where it was, collect the gamma data, get it, do the boundary picking. The boundary picking will disappear across into central and the implicit model will build out as those air core holes are being drilled and as the program advances, which gives you then the power to turn around and redirect the drill program as it's going if you're getting some unexpected results, be, they, be the results positive or negative. Um, now, you better get ready for this, and this is sort of the segue into the GSOF comment, uh, because we are building all sorts of multi-sensors now for logging in all sorts of geological environments and all sorts of drill types. Uh, so the flow of this data is going to be coming uh, thick and fast and environments where you're typically not used to getting it. Um, and to move on a little from that, because right at the beginning of this presentation, I said this is also about blasting. Um, We've heard a little bit uh, from Mike about grade control models. Um, we are extending the collection of these multi-sensor data onto the bench for the purpose of material control. So, you know, you might say that you have a grade control model. What we want to build is a material control model. If you intercepted a grade control model with a material control model, you'd have something like what Anglo would call would be a value-based or control model, right? Because grade is not necessarily king what it's sitting within, the other 98% of the rock in some cases, typically also uh, dictates the economics of what you're doing. But how to get that data? So blast holes provide an unbelievable three-dimensional picture of the bench if you're trying to put one of these models together. Um, the other thing is that with the materials, the materials have impacts for tracking and processing downstream, but they also have all sorts of impacts in blasting. Okay, so. There's just uh, one pit there and you can see the, um, the variability in fragmentation creates all sorts of downstream problems. Other problems, structures, unrecognised structures running through benches. So you can see there a blast is initiated, there's a big structure running down the middle of the bench and one side of the bench is lifting up uh, ahead of that structure so you can see all of the gases are running across there. Um, the fragmentation, uh, one side of that fracture to the other side of the fracture on that bench um, is disastrous post-blasting. Uh, other problems we can get are unexpected voids and cracks in the bench where you get incomplete detonation uh, generating fuming, so you get nitrous oxides events. So this is, we're taking the same workflow now and the end result of this is we're going to take it right through into production into blasting and optimise that as well. Um, those are above ground examples. Exactly the same problems exist but manifest themselves in slightly different ways underground. So blocked ore passes with a whole bunch of oversize coming down. Uh, Overbreak, when you're bringing down more of the stope than you wanted to. Uh, Underbreak, where you're getting less of the ore out than you wanted to, and you may not be able to go back and get that ore out post-blasting. Um, so these are all problems and issues which can be tracked back to the geology of what it is that's being blasted or being tried to be extracted for processing and milling. Um, to work on this, we've now initiated a really large project. It's between ourselves, uh, Anglo-American Tech, um, Orica, Mets ignited and CRC ore. Uh, but the, what we're trying to do is actually what I was just explaining to you with what we're trying to do with exploration drilling. So the blast hole gets drilled. We then want to put a multi-sensor, we call it, into that blast hole to measure many different things. We will then determine from those measurements what the different materials are down that hole and what sort of fracture spacing, frequency and depth exist. That can be then handed over to the likes of Orica or to the companies themselves. They can work out an optimization around the blasting method to make sure that the end result of that blast is a uniform fragmentation, no fly rock, no fuming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the downstream economic benefits are enormous. Um, if I was to put it in a slightly more uh, scientific um, realm, if you like it, a bit more technical, um, if you follow that long, they'll go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So if you follow it around, uh, the blast hole gets drilled, the integrated multi-sensor goes into the hole, collect a lot of data, 
Here we're looking at rate of penetration combined with total count gamma. We can subdivide that up. Uh, that almost looks like a plot out of biogas, but it isn't. Um, as geologists, we might sit there and give them the different names to the mining engineers, and we might call them A, B, C, and D. All they're concerned about is the uni is the uh, compressive, the tensile strength, Young's modulus, and the P wave velocity. If we tell them that and where those materials are on the bench, like in E, then those rocks can be blasted differentially to, to yield a much more uniform outcome. Um, so as we transition around that diagram, when we get down to E, and um, Mike Stewart made that for me uh, in Edge, to use there as an example, what we're building there is a material control model. It's no longer a grade control model, but of course you use both of them in conjunction. Being civilised, uh, we're using our engineers over in California to build, this, to build this tool. And you can see there, if you look up there, we have a, a fake uh, bench, if you like, with some fake blast holes drilled into it. Uh, but it's sitting in the middle of a vineyard in central California. So it's a, it's a tough place to visit to go and have a look at. Um, so here's the point. So I think the workflow I spoke about right at the beginning is enabling us in production to go from a paradigm of grade control through to material control. And I think people talk a lot about AI or machine learning in geoscience. Uh, this is one area where machine learning especially will have a lot of application. Right? It's, it's an area where it has a chance to work. It's very difficult to get it to work in exploration because often you don't know what it is you're drilling. In a mining environment at least, you have some expectation. You know what the different rock types are, what the materials are. If you can collect the end result data, it should be possible to train the system to tell you where these different materials are. Uh, a key enabler of a system like this in a producing mine is that everything is automated. As soon as anything appears in an email or a USB stick, forget about it. It's all broken and it won't work and it won't be adopted as soon as you walk out the front door. Um, and I'm just going to finish off here because of the last thing I mentioned there was machine learning. Um, I really like this cartoon because these words get bandied around a lot. Um, but just because you bring in a data scientist who is an expert in AI or machine learning uh, does not mean that you don't have to actually think and help the data scientists work out what it is they're actually there to do. Um, and that's my last message, so thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Dave. Some great tools for every exploration geologist toolkit. Uh, any questions from the audience? On your presentation, you had the geophysical probe and there was a list of promises. Can you just flick back to that? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I went over it quickly for, for a reason, but, um, <laughs> but it'll be things like conductivity, mag, sus, gamma, calipers, and whatever else we can fit into it that's slightly clever. Yeah. The, the trick is, um, you know, in blast holes, it, normally our engineers are used to trying to build things on an outside diameter of 38 millimetres. Um, the luxury they have trying to build something going into a blast hole, they can't quite believe. Uh, but now they have all this room, so they're basically jamming anything they can into it. And putting all of the sensors down one end as well, because it's, uh, sometimes you've only got six metres of hole to log and you don't want the tool to be six metres long. Any other questions? No? Okay. If anyone has any questions, they can find Dave after this afternoon's session. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. <laughs>